enorm plezier om hier, om, uh, hier te zijn vanavond uh, met u. En um, bijzonder hier bij het liberale archief, in het uh, liberale omgeving. Al deze documenten, ik heb, uh, ik was hier vanmiddag, uh, alle boeken, alle papieren, alle documenten, alle geschiedenis, het liberale <coughs> geschiedenis in dit, in dit uh, uh, uitstekende gebouw hier. Dus uh, uh, bedankt voor de uitnodiging om over uh, J.S. Mill en ja, het, het zijn de traditie waarvan hij het architect was, het Britse liberalisme en, en hoe dat... Uh, dat, uh, wat hij zou denken over, de, over het huidige uh, events hier in, in Europa en Amerika. Dat doe ik zo straks. Maar ik moet meteen zeggen, ik doe het niet in het Nederlands. Uh, het spijt me. Mijn moeder is Nederlands. Uh, ik spreek een beetje Nederlands, maar het is echt een keukentaal voor mij. Ik zou het gewoon onmogelijk zijn vinden om uh, over iemand zo, iemand zo belangrijk en zo Engels als Jazz Middel in Nederland te praten. Dus uh, ik doe het in, in zijn taal, zeg maar. Maar als... als uh, als we in de receptie hierna, als jullie de vraagjes hebben, uh, dan uh, misschien kunnen we dat in, in Nederlands doen. Maar ik ga nu door in het Engels. Um, as Tineke said, uh, J.S. Mill was an extraordinary, extraordinary individual. And he dominated the 19th century and 19th century thinking in so many respects, not just politics, science, economics, philosophy, ethics. Uh, he was uh, an extraordinary polymath. As Tineke said as well, he had this very overbearing, domineering father. And his father and Jeremy Bentham both um, almost inflicted an intellectual experiment on, on this little boy and sort of pumped him full of, of information and languages and intellectual ties. His father used to take him on walks in the afternoon and this poor little boy just sort of trot along next to his father and, and recount everything he'd learned that day. At the age of six, he'd already written the history of Rome. Uh, at seven, he was reading about Plato in Greek. I mean, it is almost impossible to imagine. Uh, and no wonder he had a breakdown 20 years uh, later. He was put under immense, immense intellectual pressure. And then, as I will describe in a minute, he developed a philosophy of his own, not least after his Break, his nervous breakdown, or his mental breakdown. Uh, and he escaped from the shadow of his father. He came to challenge the, the utilitarianism of, of Bentham. And he became the, the, the author, the, the source, the architect of what has essentially been known ever since as liberalism, particularly British liberalism, and then Anglo-American liberalism. And then also liberalism of the English-speaking world in Australia, in New Zealand, Canada, uh, India, um, and in many ways remains uh, the, 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 the kind of the genesis, his thinking at least, his writing remains the genesis of so much of what we understand to be liberalism uh, today. Uh, but interestingly, when he died in 1873, and he was buried or is buried in a little cemetery just outside Avignon. He was, like all good liberals, a passionate European, uh, even at that stage. He, uh, he, he loved France. He bought a little house uh, in Avignon. He, uh, his love of his life, Harriet Taylor, who was, was described earlier, uh, he waited for decades to finally marry her. And she wasn't just his lover, his partner. He was all, she was also his intellectual inspiration muse. And he's buried alongside her, a little cemetery outside Avignon. But the extraordinary thing is, when he was buried, there were only five people at his funeral. And he was mocked and condemned by the British newspapers, who were as unpleasant then as they are now. <laughs> uh, who mocked his feminism, who mocked his, his progressive views against slavery, who mocked how modern he was, who mocked... Uh, and denigrated his reformist zeal. So he died a fulfilled man, but in many respects a relatively lonely man. Harriet had died before him, and he died, as I say, and was buried in a funeral where only five people um, came to his funeral. And it's an important and instructive message that 
liberalism isn't often popular. Liberalism isn't easy. Liberalism is challenging. It's restless. It's subversive. It's not something which people often adopt as a sort of mass movement. Liberalism is almost always anti-establishment. Liberalism is always challenging hierarchy, is always challenging convention. And so liberalism waxes and wanes, but it's, it's, it's often a philosophy, and J.S. Mill's life showed this, which is shunned and rejected by the establishment, and very rarely taken up by mass popular uh, movements. And I think that is probably as true today as it was at any time since J.S. Mill died in 1873. So what I'd like to do in the time available is talk to you about um, three particular beliefs of J.S. Mill. One, his belief in reason. Two, his belief in the sanctity of the individual. And three, his optimism, his belief in progress. And all of them, as I will come to explain, seem to me to be quintessentially liberal assertions. And then I want to just spend a bit of time applying those liberal beliefs to today. And to ask the unanswerable question of what would J.S. Mell think if he were to be reincarnated today and re-emerge today uh, from his deathbed in 1873. What would he think about the world we now occupy, we think it's become more liberal, less liberal. Would he celebrate the way we conduct our politics? What would he make of the developments of today? So first, reason. Let me read out, if I may, uh, a sh very short passage by J.S. Mill, uh, where he is making the argument in favour of reason <coughs> uh, and against something that he called, I'll refer to it again later, what he called intuitionism. Uh, the, the belief that somehow, intuitively, sort of hardwired in our brain, the, the truth is sort of in, in, inside us and we don't need to look for the evidence of it outside us. Um, and he wrote the following. He said, the notion that truths external to the mind may be known by intuition or consciousness, independently of observation and experience, is, I am persuaded, the great intellectual support of false doctrines and bad institutions. By the aid of this theory, every inveterate belief and every intense feeling is enabled to dispense with the obligation of justifying itself by reason. Now forgive me, his language is 19th century English, so it's quite convoluted. But in a sense, what he's saying, he's rejecting the idea, which was very fashionable at the time, and was espoused by Kant and many other philosophers at the time, that somehow the outside world, the physical world, is something we could understand by, by referring to our own internal intuitions, what he calls uh, intuition or consciousness. And that in a sense, that, that philosophy meant you didn't really need to bother too much about observing the empirical world. You just needed to rely upon your own intuitions, or as he says as well, your intense feelings to try and establish the truth. And he says, in my view, quite correctly, that that uh, leads to false doctrines and bad institutions uh, because it uh, frees people from having to use reason. And it's incredibly important to remember what a radical, what it might seem obvious to us now to celebrate reason. But in the 19th century, when religion obviously played, a, and indeed superstition a, played a much, much greater role in the way people thought and felt and organized society, in which hierarchy, <coughs> and a rigid uh, sort of vertical pecking order in society meant that reason was regarded with some suspicion. Um, and crucially, where 
as J.S. Mill was writing at the time, the major philosophers of the day, uh, in effect, asserted that reason was not necessary, that intuition and feeling and instinct and consciousness should be the principal guide by which you seek to arrive at the truth. And so it was a remarkably simple, yes, but also a radical assertion to say that far from simply relying on your own intuition or your own emotions or your own consciousness, you need to test yourself against observed reality, against your physical and wider environment, against empirical evidence. And that was something which guided him all his life. It made him, it made him an awkward character, a difficult character, because he never, he never accepted many of the other assumptions that were simply uh, thrown around at the time. He constantly wanted everything tested by evidence. And it is something which, it distresses me, that however much, and I read that passage, I find it, and no doubt you find it, utterly obvious that reason, that what we think and observe, and what we try and rationally decide, should, is a better guide for how we act together in society than what we simply feel at any point. We actually find ourselves now in a time of politics where feeling and intuition is once again dominant and the principles of rationality and reason are once again being denigrated. And I'll come back to that. The second thing is his view of the, of the individual. And he said something quite interesting about, about his, uh, his own upbringing. And he said, I felt as if I was scientifically proved to be the helpless slave of antecedent circumstances. As if my character and that of all others had been formed for us by agencies beyond our control and was wholly out of our own power. So again, forgive me, the, the prose is quite complex and convoluted. But what he says is that he felt, and it's perhaps no surprise, given how he was brought up by this very overbearing father and by Jeremy Bentham, who, as I said, sort of treated him like some sort of laboratory intellectual experiment. That he felt that he was that his own individual identity, his own sense of self-worth, how he defined himself, who he was, was something that was given to him, was imposed upon him, was ascribed to him. It was not something that he could form himself. Um, and if you read accounts of J.S. Mill's life, and certainly if you read accounts of, as Dinica referred to, this breakdown he had, this emotional, mental breakdown he had, and then he resorted, as, uh, as Tineke described, to romantic literature, to poetry, particularly Wordsworth. Wordsworth was a huge source of comfort to him. He, he, he almost reassembled how he thought about himself. And he appreciated he wasn't just a brain, he was a soul as well. He needed to nourish his heart and his feelings as well as his, his uh, ability for cerebral thought. But crucially, he came to realise that, as he put it, that how he developed was something in his power, in his gift. That there was something inherently sovereign about the individual. That the individual didn't just have his or her identity written for, written for them by others. That it was in the power of each individual to improve, develop, shape and evolve their own identity as they could and as they, as they wished. And again, that seems so obvious to us now, but again, if you think back to the 19th century, where uh, everything from the monarchy to the residual feudal relationships in the countryside to the astonishingly stark inequalities between the industrial owning classes and uh, others, the rigidity of the a class system, a philosophy which said you can constitute your own personal identity regardless of the circumstances in which you find yourself is again a remarkably subversive 
liberal thought. If I think about my own the political environment which I've operated in for many years now in the United Kingdom, uh, politics changes, leaders go up and down, governments come and go. But in the United Kingdom, it's, I suspect it's a bit different here, but in the United Kingdom you basically have three fundamental political <coughs> schools of thought. Conservatism, which, as the name describes, is a, is a philosophy which believes in conserving, broadly speaking, the status quo, and crucially not, not reversing the kind of hierarchies that exist within society. Conservatives believe that power is there to be uh, managed in a way which doesn't try to um, reverse or upset the established order of things too much, that power is the way in which one manages change with a minimum amount of disruption to the conserved order of things. Socialism, obviously a great 20th century tradition, is principally uh, rests on a belief that social progress, and particularly the emancipation of working families, working men and women, is best done by deploying the power of the state and the power of collective action in order to open up opportunities for millions of people who otherwise don't have access to those opportunities. Liberalism, in my view, others may have different definitions of it, uh, is rooted in these very words that I just read out from J.S. Mill, that at the heart of everything we do, there is a belief in the beauty and the sanctity and the sovereignty of the individual. That there is something extraordinary in every single individual. And that the role of politics is not to dictate to individuals, but to try and create an environment <coughs> in which individuals can pursue their dreams, uh, exploit their talents and their gifts to the very fullest of their abilities and their wishes without being blocked or hampered from doing so. And so, I think these words, again, whilst they might be obvious to us, were certainly radical then, but still, in my view, are exceptional today. It's the reason why liberals care so much about privacy, when you have this debate about, you know, how much privacy and do we give up in order to keep us all safe. It's something that a socialist never understands. A socialist says, well, I don't care what powers the state has. As long as we go after the bad people, you know, I don't care. Because they, don't, they just don't care about the, 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 the sort of sanctity of the privacy of the individual. Um, but equally, a conservative is unsettled by the idea that a liberal believes that everybody, everybody should have the same fair access to opportunities, regardless of the circumstances of their birth. And I think that individualism is often, is often a phrase used or a word used to imply selfishness or excessive consumerism. I, I personally see it as something quite different. I see it as a quintessentially human belief in the kind of wondrous ability for everybody to do <coughs> unusual things and great things and to live out happy and fulfilled lives. Uh, and that is something which I think comes and flows directly from from J.S. Mill. And the third, the third point I wanted to make about his thinking is his belief, uh, which is a very liberal belief, mm, in the ability for society to progress in such a way that tomorrow is generally better than today and today is better than yesterday. In other words, a very liberal belief in progress. It's an optimistic, it's, a, it's, it's an optimistic view of society that, however bumpy the road, broadly speaking, the road is heading in a, more, in a better, more progressive, more emancipated direction. And again, let me read out some beautiful, if complex, prose to illustrate that point. He said about human nature, he said, human nature is not a machine to be built after a model and set to do exactly the work prescribed for it but a tree which requires to grow and develop itself on all sides according to the tendency of the inward forces which make it a living thing. 
And he also said, which is commensurate with the optimism, the belief that society, human nature, is a, is a tree which, which should be allowed to blossom and grow and evolve. He also said, most of great positive evils of the world are in themselves removable and will, if human affairs continue to improve, be in the end reduced within narrow limits. In other <laughs> words, he believed that bad stuff, over time, generally speaking, would become less bad, if only we ensure that we organise ourselves in a way which allows that tree, which he talked about, to flourish and grow to its natural capacity. Now, he... He didn't always have that optimism. I mean, he, in a sense, he had his Donald Trump Brexit moment uh, when, of course, the uh, when, of course, the Second Republic in France uh, collapsed a few years after 18, after the 1848 revolution and um, uh, and the coup by um, uh, Louis and Napoleon, and the restoration of the monarchy. And it, it was one of the rare moments where he suddenly started doubting his faith in reason and progress, and he, he started even toying with the very illiberal idea that, that only the educated should have a vote, and the uneducated should not. So he had his dark moment of the soul where he doubted whether progress really was something which uh, moved linearly from one state of improvement to the next. But broadly speaking, this optimism was something that he, he believed in. Uh, but, and it was something that uh, I think he has handed down to liberals ever since. So what would J.S. Mill, with his belief in reason, rather than just emotion, with his belief in the sanctity and beauty of the individual, not just the, 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 the instincts of the, the moment, um, his fear, as Tina said earlier, about the tyranny of the majority, Someone who believed that progress was a positive thing, was always optimistic about uh, the future. What would he think about today? <coughs> well, I think he'd be pretty depressed. I think he'd be utterly dismayed. I think he would, he would um, marvel, obviously, at our scientific improvements. And there was so much, particularly, that science has brought to human development, both good and bad, which I think would fascinate him. Of course he would be delighted, he was a genuine feminist. I mean, one so far ahead of his time, it is, it is almost extraordinary to uh, uh, imagine uh, how radical he must have been at the time. He, might, he would be delighted, whilst the feminist journey is by no means complete, he would be delighted that it is much further advanced than it was, than it was in his day. But I think he would be shocked to his core that in the world which he was most familiar with, the Anglo-American world, you have in Donald Trump now the triumph of someone who explicitly scorns and rejects the politics of reason, who loathes reason, detests intellectuals, denigrates science, abhors the rule of law, thinks that rational, rules-based means by which the affairs of the world can be organised, whether it's the United Nations or NATO, are somehow a constraint on the muscular macho power which he feels should be wielded by him irrationally and capriciously as he sees fit. I think he'd be deeply deeply shocked that the most powerful nation on earth, in which many congressmen and congresswomen cite J.S. Mill in their speeches, have portraits of J.S. Mill in their offices, learn about J.S. Mill at school and college, should be enveloped now in a politics which celebrates unreason and feeling and emotion and mass anger over the politics of reason that he uh, believed in. And equally, I think, in the United Kingdom, he would be utterly dismayed that untruth and 
fake news and misinformation and downright old-fashioned falsehoods and lies should have succeeded in winning a debate about a country's future in which anger and rage and emotion completely obliterated the arguments of reason and rationality and logic um, just a short while ago on the 23rd of June uh, 2016 at the time of the Brexit a referendum. I think he'd be horrified by all those developments. And then he'd look more broadly at the eruption of populism in developed democracies across Europe and North America. Not just Trump, not just Brexit, but the power of Marine Le Pen, of Viktor Orban, the chauvinists who now run the Polish government, of Alternative for Deutschland, uh, of Gerd Wilders, and what he will see if he were to survey that scene is that of course all of these populisms are different. And by the way, populism isn't always bad. Mahatma Gandhi was a pop populist of sort, sorts. In its purest sense, populism is a rejection of an established or elite point of view by a popular public opinion which feels that it is being overlooked or denigrated. So it's not always negative. But it generally has quite dark and negative connotations. Some of them are pretty common everywhere. I mean, one of the things that you will hear all populists say, whether it's Nigel Farage in the United Kingdom, or Donald Trump in America, or Herr Wilders in the Netherlands, or Marine Le Pen in France, and so on, is this belief that the populist alone understands the, the will of the people. And by the way, the people are lumped together. The people. So the people, says Donald Trump, have been betrayed by a Washington out-of-touch elite. The people, says Nigel Farage, have been betrayed by an out-of-touch Brussels elite. The people, says Kurt Wilders, have been uh, menaced by an Islamist threat uh, from which only he can protect them. In other words, what the populist always does is says that he or she, as a populist, feels the rage and the frustration and the anger in a way that no one else does. And there's almost a sort of unique umbilical relationship between the populist and the folk, the people. And then what the populist does is it, the populist says, and it's their fault, the clapped out, out of touch elite, and then the third thing the populists always do is they say, and I'll tell you what, I've got a simple way in which all of that will be solved. And Donald Trump says, I'll build a wall against the Mexicans and all will be well. All those jobs that were lost in the, in the Rust Belt in the United States will miraculously re-emerge if we keep these wretched Mexicans out. Nigel Farage says, all we need to do is pull out of the European Union and all will be well. Britain will be restored to its neo-imperial glory. Herr Wilders says all we need to do is reject Islam, throw the Muslims out, condemn a whole religion, and all will be well in the Netherlands. Marine Le Pen says it's all to do with immigration, and so on and so forth. So the populists are, all, are always very skilled at harnessing what is often very legitimate public rage, and then claiming that they have a unique relationship with the people, which is, by the way, why populists hate judges, or a free press, or parliaments. Because populists can't bear to be told that anyone else might have a say about how power is administered. J.S. Mill would hate that. He would hate that. Not only did he believe in the politics of reason, he also believed that it's very important that in, when people wield power, they wield power in a way which is held to account and that there are checks and balances in the way in which power uh, is, uh, is, uh, is wielded. So I think he'd be deeply, deeply alarmed. Now there are many that. reasons, and I certainly don't have the time to go into uh, very many of them, why this eruption of populism has occurred throughout the democratic world in recent years. Some of them are long-term reasons. Uh, we live in an environment of much greater ideological fluid, fluidity than used to be the case. I'm now 50 years old. 
in my teens and my twenties when I first started, you know, developing my own political ideas, the political landscape was so simple. It was either the right or the left. You were either in favour of the workers, the bosses, the public sector, the private sector, high taxes, low, set, low taxes, the north, the south, and behind it all was this sort of ideological scaffolding of the Cold War and the great standoff between Western capitalism and Soviet communism. And basically, certainly in the United Kingdom and most other democracies, everyone basically lined up on one side or the other, either left or right. You had a few eccentric liberals trying to eke out an existence somewhere else, but basically that's what... And people voted, by the way, as their parents did, and their grandparents did. It was an intergenerational form of political identity. All of that disappeared in the wake of the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the end of history as Francis Fukuyama uh, wrongly predicted at the time, and it's given way to a degree of ideological fluidity now, where actually those old debates, market versus state, private versus public, they, they're not actually the things that really animate people anymore. What, people, what animate people now is the politics of identity, religious identity, ethnic identity. It's why we're seeing this eruption of nationalisms, whether it's in Catalonia, or Kurdistan, or Scotland. What happens when, those, when the ideological polarization collapses is that people look for new forms of identity. We are social animals, as well as being sovereign individuals. People need a tribe to be part of. It's quite a visceral thing. And so whether it's Islamist identity, regional identity, ethnic identity, a whole array, a whole menu of new ideological identities are colliding with each other in much more volatile and unpredictable ways. Technology clearly has contributed to all of this. I remember years ago when social media first became a realistic prospect. I used to read these sort of portentous articles which said, oh, it's marvellous because the internet and our ability to be able to express ourselves digitally whenever and wherever we want will create an almost perfect democracy where we will all sort of express ourselves in the ether and everybody will listen to each other and there will be this mass sort of digital demos in the sky somewhere. It's a lovely vision. In fact, curiously enough, almost exactly the reverse has happened. What social media has allowed us to do is to create these bubbles where we shout in furious agreement with each other and condemn everybody else. And so you're seeing a, you're seeing a sort of pillarization, a balkanization of debate aided and abetted by social media, which, which really worries me. Because mature democracies rely on the ability for people to disagree with each other, but disagree with each other tolerantly. To acknowledge that other people have other points of view, and that we <coughs> almost try and accommodate ourselves to those different points of view. There is an intolerance which is fostered by the kind of 140 character fury of an of a ideological or political tweet, which I think uh, uh, serves us ill. So there are those and many other reasons. But the single biggest reason, by far, in, from my point of view, for the reason for the eruption of populism across the democratic world is the terrible, terrible socioeconomic effects of the 2008 crash. I think it is impossible to exaggerate how legitimately angry millions of people feel in the wake of the 2008 crash. A crash. I remember on the evening of the 22nd of June 2016, I was standing on a street corner in my then constituency in Sheffield, handing out leaflets, trying to persuade people to vote the following day uh, uh, to remain in the European Union. And this man across the street waved to me in a very friendly way, so high neck, and I, I knew him. He, I'd helped his, uh, he was a constituent of mine, and I'd helped his daughter, who had learning difficulties, get into a local school some time before. Big guy, great tattoos on his arms, he was a self-employed builder. <coughs> Greeted each other. I said, how are you going to vote tomorrow? He said, oh, I'm going to vote Brexit. I said, oh, you don't want to do that. Oh, by the way, he then said, oh, he then said, oh don't worry, you're going to win anyway. Uh, which is uh, yeah. quite, a, quite an insight into how expectations can uh, drive how people vote. But then he said something which I will never forget. He said to me, he said, oh, come on, you can't expect me to tick a box which says remain. As if everything should remain the same. As if everything is okay. It's not okay. I am furious. I'm working longer hours 
than I ever have done, and I'm earning less money every week and every month. Every week and every month, I'm taking that much little less money home. Less money for my kids, less money for my elderly parents, less money to take my family on holiday, less money to improve my own home, and it's not my fault. It's these wretched bankers in the city of London, and you politicians who say it's all getting better, and the regulators who screwed up. It's not my fault. And he said, that's why I'm not going to tick the box says remain. Anything is better than this. It's been eight long years that my and my family have been suffering through no fault of our own. I want to change. I don't care what the change is. I couldn't answer that. And I could try. I could try and explain that actually even the European Union is going to make the matters even worse. But the emotion was such a legitimate emotion. This rage against the status quo. And for him, the opportunity to reject the status quo when offered to him in that referendum was uh, uh, an overwhelming uh, temptation. And, you know, going back to J.S. Mill, I think, I think the, 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 the socio-economic circumstances in which he operated and the socio-economic circumstances in which we operate now are probably more important in many respects than any number of speeches, books and essays he might have written because if people feel that there is no connection between how hard they work and the reward they get then the basic cement the basic glue of an open liberal democracy starts to disintegrate i personally i can't test this for you but i think if 2008 had not happened donald trump would not have been elected if 2008 not happened, I doubt very much we would have had a Brexit today. I think when the history books are written, we will look back and realise that even today, in 2017, we're living in the shadow of 2008. And that in a mature, open society, if, if people are deprived of the basic sense of economic security, and there's a link, as I say, between the effort they make and the reward they get. I think in the absence of that, it is exceptionally difficult to build a sustainable liberal society. So if there's any final message I have, it is, A, of course, we should always defend reason and condemn the politics of anger and unreason. Just because anger can be so visceral, we should never give up on the virtues of reason. <coughs> we should remember that however much I as a liberal believe, as I said earlier, in the sanctity of the individual, everybody, all human beings, also need a sense of community, need a sense of belonging. It's why I always get very frustrated when some liberals sometimes can be quite dismissive of patriotism. Patriotism can be ugly, but patriotism can also be incredibly positive. A belief in nation, a belief in community, a belief in the whole can be a positive thing which I think should be embraced and not shunned by liberals. But the most important message I think for all liberals everywhere is that unless we do the homework to reform our deeply damaged and over leveraged capitalist system, we can talk about liberalism as much as we like but our, our liberalism will fall on fallow ground. Because liberalism only really is taken into people's hearts as well as their minds if they feel they have the security and the prosperity and the safety to do so. Thank you very much.